Well, I'm going to make a statement that I believe is universally true, and that is that children in the same house are different. They may look alike, but oftentimes they are very different. Uh, they have different personalities. Uh, some are the life of the party. Others are reserved and quiet. Some are jokesters. Some are very serious. Just look at Julia and Michaela. Look at Zylon, Zion and Sela, or Amelia and Carolina. I mean, look at any couple of kids in the same home and you see it. They have different gifts, different demeanors. Some, some are compliant to their parents and some have a like, defiant streak. Some are leaders and other children follow them and, and some are followers. Some are homebodies and they never want to venture out uh, and others want to go out. Some will climb, climb out of the crib before they're one year old while others will stick in there until they're three. Some kids need a little discipline, other kids need a lot of discipline. I remember Pastor Ed Moore saying that out of his four children, his son Charlie got like 85% of all the discipline. And he needed it. There are some kids who are sickly, other kids who are strong and healthy. Some are athletic, others are not so and uncoordinated. My brother and I are 19 months apart, and I was pretty athletic back in those days and played on a lot of teams and sports and stuff, and my brother was not and therefore did not. Some kids are smart, mentally quick and sharp. Other kids, not so much. Some kids are book kids. They love to read. They love to learn. And other kids just like to go out and play. So no two kids are the same. Uh, e even though they're in the same family, no two kids are the same. And, and, and their differences shouldn't separate them, and they don't. Right, but endear them to each other. Well, as children of God, we are very different. We don't look the same. We don't come from the same backgrounds. We have different gifts and different abilities. We have different leanings in life. We have different struggles and weaknesses, but we are the family of Christ. We are one in Christ. We're his body. Romans 12, 4 and 5 says, For as we are, have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members that of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So we are all in the body of Christ. We are all members of this church. Yet we have different functions. We have different giftings and different abilities. And it is critical for the health of the body of the church that we get along with each other and care for each other, that we genuinely love each other. Because where there is division and where there is strife, the body struggles to function as God intended it to function. So it's important that all the members live with each other in a selfless, loving way. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13, we looked at two weeks ago, Paul tells the saints how they should respond to the elders. And that is to recognize them and to submit to their leadership. Then he tells the elders how they're to respond to the saints. And that is by laboring hard and caring for their souls and to admonish those who need admonishing. Well, now in verses 14 and 15, he tells, he tells them how the saints should respond to the saints, and particularly those who struggle in different ways. And I'd like to look at these two verses in a sermon titled, Warn, Comfort, and Uphold, using a two-point outline. The first one is, our actions towards others, and secondly, our attitude towards others, so our actions and our attitudes. And let's look at our actions towards others, and I'll read the first part of verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, Warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak. And the word exhort means to plead with, to beg, to urge, to beseech. And what Paul is urging them to do is to minister to the problematic and struggling saints. And we know Paul is talking to the saints here and not just the elders, as he just was a, a verse or two ago, because he calls them brethren, as he did two verses ago when he was speaking to the saints on how they were to respond to their elders. So this word is for all Christians. Now, now, what we need to know is that the three verbs here, which are warn, comfort, and uphold, are all commands 
And, and they are all in the present tense, which means they're not optional. This isn't, this isn't something that we can do if we want to do it or don't do it, if we don't want to do it. It's, it these are mandatory. Uh, and they're to be followed all the time. Uh, so they should become the pattern of our lives. Uh, and these commands show us that Paul cares for the whole body of Christ, and he wants us to care as well. Uh, and, he, and he will tell us to do three things, and that is to warn the unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, and uphold the weak. And so first he says, warn the unruly. And warn means to admonish, to caution. Uh, it literally means to put in the mind. Uh, and that happens through instruction. Through instruction. Uh, and, and, and in Acts 20.31, Paul told the Ephesian elders to watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn, there's the word, to warn everyone night and day with tears. Instruction. Romans 5, 14, 15, 14, he said, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another, to warn one another. So believers need to warn unruly believers by instructing them of what is right, to keep them from doing what is wrong. Uh, and as I said in my last sermon a couple of weeks ago, we don't like it. We don't like to admonish a brother or a sister for really any reason. It makes us uncomfortable, right? Because it, we may not be well received. We don't want people to think bad of us. Thus, we shy away from it. But if we really love one another, we must prayerfully and gently warn them, right? We must prayerfully, warn, prayerfully and gently correct those who are straying away from God. Now, now, now the word unruly means out of order, out of line, out of step. And this word was used in secular Greek of soldiers not keeping the ranks uh, or of an army in disarray. Uh, and this is the only time this word is used in the New Testament. And we see the idea of this word in Colossians 2 verse 5 where Paul says, For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing, here it is, to see your good order. See your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Uh, so their good order was that they were lining up or they were in step with the Word of God. Now, from the context of 1 Thessalonians, uh, there may have been some saints uh, who would not, to sum would not submit to the authority of the elders, uh, nor would they recognize them, uh, as we said the last time in the last few verses we looked at. Uh, so, so, they, so they would have been unruly or out of step in how God had ordered the church to be governed. Also, they may have been unruly because some of them didn't work or wouldn't work, but instead they were mooching off the other saints. Uh, and we see this problem, as we read already, uh, in 2 Thessalonians, verses 3 to 6, and I'll just read it again, just to set it up again. He says, We command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, and not according to the tradition which we receive from us. For, for you yourselves know how you ought to also follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we ha not have authority, uh, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. Here it is. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner not working at all, but a busy bodies. Busy bodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. So they were disorderly and out of line. And how? By not working and being busy bodies. So instead of going out, right, going out and making a living, they just hung around and, and talked about people and butted into other people's business. Speaking to the younger widows, Paul said in 1 Timothy 5.13 that, that they shouldn't learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. Uh, and not only idle, but they also were gossips and busybodies saying things which they ought not. So some of the Thessalonian saints didn't want to work. And the question is why? Why don't they want to work? You know, during the pandemic... Uh, and this is the case in our day as well, right, where people don't want to work. During the pandemic, I knew a few professing Christians who, who, who didn't go to work because they said, I can make more money on unemployment and all this other stuff the government has given away, 
then I can't have my job, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna not work. I'm gonna quit my job. And that's what they did. So, so then the question is, were the Thessalonians lazy? Just trying to beat the system, collecting freebies from the city? I really don't think so. I think the reason some of them didn't work is because they thought that Jesus was returning at any moment. And, and we see this from Paul's answers to their questions concerning Christ's return in chapter 4 and chapter 5, which we went over already. In chapter 4, the question was, will our loved ones who have already passed away, will they have missed the, the resurrection of the dead? Like, because when Christ comes, you know, are they going to be resurrected as well, or is it just those who are standing here and now? So they obviously thought that this was coming soon. And then in chapter 5, they want to know, when is it? What is the timing? So, so the Thessalonians thought the return of Christ was coming any day now. And so some of them quit their jobs. They quit their jobs. Why spend eight, ta- eight to ten hours a day working when Christ is on his way now anyway? Uh, why make money to pay rents and mortgages or to save for retirement if this will all be over soon? Why spend hours a day on trains and buses or long car rides if Christ will be here shortly? I remember back in uh, 1994, Harold Camping made his first of many predictions of the second coming. And I knew a guy who actually quit his job and sold all of his stuff, believing it was all unnecessary because the world was going to end on whatever that there was in in 1994. Uh, So the point here is, it is unruly not to work and support yourself if you can. It is also unruly to cause division in the church or to campaign against the doctrine of the church, or to slander the leaders of the church. About six months ago, I was talking to a man from another church, and he had a lot of issues with the pastor of his church. And he said to me, he said, I can't sit under this guy anymore. And then he said that he was going to go to the next business meeting, and he was going to tell everyone all of the issues that he had with that pastor. And I pleaded with him not to do that. I pleaded with him not to do that. Don't do that. Just go away quietly. Let the Lord handle it. He refused. And he went to the business meeting, and he railed against the pastor, and then he left, taking some people with him. That's unruly. That's unruly. So the unruly person is the one who looks out for themselves and not for others. It's the one who who does what he's told not to do and doesn't do what he knows he should do. The the unruly don't want to get involved in the church, Right? They don't want to be accountable to anybody. And they don't want to support the church, and quite honestly, they're not committed to it anyway. Uh, and they are often critical of the church. So they are out of step with the church. They, they are like an extra in a movie. You know what an extra is, right? They're background. They're just to fill the scene, so to speak. But they're not really in the movie. They're an extra. They're in the background. You don't really notice them. They come to church, but they don't engage with the people. They're in and out in no time. Uh, And sadly, some create strife and even seek to divide the church. Well, Paul says we need to warn them uh, that they're heading into the rod of God. They're heading into the rod of God. We need to tell them uh, the way they're living and the way they're thinking is contrary to God. And it never goes well for those who go against against God. It just doesn't go well. Uh, We need to warn them of of the blessings they're forfeiting and the joys that they're missing out on and the dishonor that they're bringing to the one who is the lover of their souls. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, James says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. But we're to warn those who are unruly. Secondly, we're to comfort the faint-hearted. And the faint-hearted means to lack courage, to be intimidated, to lose heart, to lose heart. And the word literally means to be little-souled, little-souled. Uh, and one is one who is easily overwhelmed. Uh, so these are, are brethren who are afraid of difficulties, uh, who are disheartened by, by thoughts of trouble and losses and afflictions. They're worriers. And sadly, they're motivated by fear. Uh, They're afraid to step out in faith. You you could tell them something and show them how they should step out in faith, but they'll give you 10 reasons why they can't do something or try something. The glass is always half empty. For them, 
The issues of life are more than they can bear. They fear the unknown. They want a risk-free, suffering-free life. Uh, and they give up easy, and they will throw in the towel at the first sign of resistance. Thus, they lack boldness. They are concerned about failure and can't rise above their problems. Proverbs 18, 14 says, The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? And from time to time, most of us have been faint-hearted or weary. I have been faint-hearted from time to time. We get beaten down. We become disillusioned because we didn't think we would face such opposition for Christ. We didn't think we would struggle so greatly in so many areas. We didn't think we'd be so easily tempted and so often to sin. And, and it seems at times like we don't have victory over sins, certain sins. And some of us grow weary because we're married to an unsaved person or lived with unsaved family. And that brings a lot of conflict into our lives. Or we're faint-hearted because our desire to live for Christ seems so easily railroaded. And we become faint-hearted when we see the state of the world that we live in. And trust me, it is tanking more and more as we go on. Where babies are slaughtered in the womb by the millions, and our politicians applaud it. They sign legislation that makes it legal in states to abort a baby right up to birth. Right up to birth. And if the baby is born, well, if the parent doesn't want that baby, well, then they can let the baby die on the table. You know, that's okay, too. Where we live in a world where no one knows what the definition of a woman is. Can you believe this? Or if you say a man can't have a baby, well, then you're transphobic. And then there is the blatant and rank debauchery of, of all kinds of sexual immorality and perversion that we live around. And wanting to indoctrinate uh, kindergartners, first graders, second graders, third graders, with, with these sexual acts. Let them know they need to know about these things. Well, do they really? Why can't kids be kids? Why can't kids be kids? And then we become faint-hearted with the state of the church. With the state of the church. With the abundance of charlatans out there gouging people for money with a false gospel. Listen, on August 6th, you'll see it in your bulletin, Joel Olstein is going with his wife to Yankee Stadium and he is going to fill the house as he did six, seven years ago. By the way, that's where I met Pastor Phil and Jose. Six, seven years ago, I forget. Eight years ago, whatever it was. But I met him outside of Yankee Stadium, not to play ball, but to share the gospel. But he's going there and he's going to fill the house, 45,000 people or whatever it is, and he's going to tell them how good they're doing and how much God is good with what their life is like and they don't have to worry about anything. It's going to make them feel good charlatan and so many are preaching a partial gospel or no gospel at all and, and and many disregard god's order in the church as if god has to acquiesce to the cultural norms of the of the 21st century and so few who claim to be believers really want to hear the truth rather they want to be entertained they want to feel something they want to have an experience so they're seeking everything but Christ. And I can't tell you how many reject the sound biblical teaching of the word for the charismatic chaos that goes on in our day. And, and few seem to care about the glory of God, nor have a genuine fear of him. I mean, an awe and a reverence of God. He's God. And you can just throw up your hands and say, what's the use? What's the use? We could be like Elijah who asked the Lord, take my life. Take my life. Lord, nobody, nobody in Israel believes anyway. It's just me. It's just me. Not knowing that God had reserved 7,000 in Israel had not bowed the knee to Baal. Listen, when people are struggling, when they are weary, God can seem very far from them. And they can begin to question him with questions like, is God punishing me? Is he angry with me? Why doesn't he help me? Does he really care about me? And our, and our instinct is to hide our face from him. But the weary, the faint-hearted need to be encouraged. They need to be reminded that God is there for them. That, 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 that they don't need bold faith to approach him. They just need genuine faith. Even if it's small faith. 
The Puritan Richard Sibbs said this. He said, a weak hand can receive an expensive jewel. A weak hand can receive an expensive jewel. And every Christian already has the expensive jewel of salvation. If you're a believer today, you own that. That is yours forever. You have Christ. You have it. And that jewel is not going to tarnish by the weakness of the hand that holds it. It is not going to tarnish by the weakness of the hand that holds it. So they need to be encouraged or comforted that Christ supports them in their weaknesses and will deal tenderly with them. Speaking of the Messiah, we read in Isaiah 42 that a bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice and truth. So Jesus comes to bring justice, but he deals gently with bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks. And the bruised reed and the smoking wick, that's the faint-hearted. They are those who struggle with doubts. They struggle with assurance. They struggle with a weak conscience at times. So Paul says, comfort them. Remind them that Christ sympathizes with them because he's one of them. He's one of them. Hebrews 14, 4, 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He knows. He cares. He comforts. Now in our weaknesses, it would be easy to think that Christ grows tired of hearing our woes. Maybe because we grow tired of hearing other people's woes. I mean, I sadly have been there. You tell me something a hundred times how bad you've had it, I can say to myself, well, here we go again. But not Christ, right? Christ doesn't do that, therefore nor should we. So the, the faint-hearted need, need to be comforted by the promises of God. Like Isaiah 41.10, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 43, 1 says, Fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. You're mine. I purchased you. I have loved you forever. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you tank. I love you. Like 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7, Therefore, he says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him. Why? He cares for you. Throw them on him. Unload them. He wants them. Wants to help us. Wants us to grow in trusting in him. It's like Jesus' promise to the church. He says, I'm saying to you, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or the grave shall not prevail against it. Listen, don't think because you see all this garbage going on everywhere and the church sort of buying into the, the culture, don't think that I'm not controlling everything. And don't think I'm not building my church. I am. I am. And there are hundreds and hundreds of other promises throughout the scriptures. So the faint-hearted Christians need to be encouraged to carry on and to not lose heart, to keep their eyes fixed on Christ and the reward that awaits them in heaven. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary while well, well doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. There's the qualifier, if. So let us not give up doing the right thing, even though we see so little fruit at times, even though we suffer for it. Let us not grow weary in prayer even though it seems like nothing changes. We pray, we pray, we pray, and then nothing seems to change. As if God were on our schedule, working on our clock. Well, we know he's not. He's on his clock. Listen, the reason Jesus told his disciples the parable of the persistent widow, he tells us in the beginning of Luke 18 that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Keep praying. Don't lose heart. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So our own physical frailties and weaknesses shouldn't cause us to lose heart. Why? Because we know what it's leading to. 
We know where it ends. We know where we're going. We know who's got us in his grip. We know what's coming and the glory to come. We know it. We know how that all happens. Well, Paul says, warn the unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, and thoroughly uphold the weak. And the weak means the feeble, those without strength. Uh, and the weak are not the physically weak here, although we should indeed uphold the physically weak, but he's not talking about that here. Rather, he's talking about the spiritually weak. The spiritually weak. These are the believers who are usually immature in their faith, uh, and, 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 and therefore they're weak in their faith, and they are easily offended uh, by the Christian liberty of others, which they don't understand. They don't understand. So they could fall into sin because someone has a drink or smokes an occasional cigar or uh, likes to listen to uh, secular music once in a while or has a tattoo or whatever. Right? They don't fully grasp grace yet. They don't understand grace. Many religious systems do not understand grace at all. It's rigid. It's legalistic. They don't understand grace. This is not saying lawlessness here, but God gives grace. So they're weak, and therefore they're easily offended. This is why Paul said in Romans 15, verses 1 and 2, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. You see, many Christians in the early church came out of pagan backgrounds, worshiping in pagan temples. And the meat that they would sacrifice in those pagan temples to those pagan gods afterward was sold in the local butcher shop. And mature Christians could easily go and buy the meat from the, from the butcher shop. But the immature Christians uh, were, were, were troubled by that. Right? They, they were troubled that, the, that, the, that there were Christians who could buy it and eat it because the weak Christian couldn't do it. To them, eating that meat was a sin. So Paul says in Romans 14, he says, don't cause the weaker brother to stumble. And in this case, don't eat meat when they're around. Don't do it. And believers are weak because some of them are still feeding on milk and not meat of the word at this point. A couple of months ago, I got a call from a guy who wanted to know if he had committed the unpardonable sin. I think I said this once before because he had bad thoughts about Jesus. And I patiently and hopefully biblically told him why that couldn't be the case. Listen, when you're immature, you are prone to fall into all kinds of sins and to be led in all different ways because you lack grounding and stability in God's word and you can be easily carried away. And then you are easy pickings for the wicked one, especially when you're around the old friends and the old life. So the more mature Christians are to uphold the weaker ones. And uphold means to hold close, to, hold, to keep someone up. And I think the weak ones, I think the weak are the ones that James has in mind uh, in James 5.14. Is anyone among you sick? And the word sick is actually the word in Greek, weak. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So if you're struggling with sin, call for the more mature Christians to pray for you, in this case, your elders. We also read in Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Strong help the weak. Then in verse 2 we read, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So bear the burden of the weak by restoring them through the word. That's what he's saying. So then, so then all three of these commands, to warn, to comfort, and to uphold, necessitate engaging with the saints who struggle. I mean, we gotta necess you got to know them. You can't do any of those commands if you don't know who the people are. But that makes sense, right? you you, you got to know them. And listen... This is the work of the church. Well, Pastor, you and Phil should do that. No. Well, yes, we should do that. You too. You too, right? This is all of our work. This is the work of all of us. And, and in, in order for us to grow stronger, we need to invest in the weaker and the wayward. In order for us to function as the body of Christ, we need all the parts of the body ministering to the body. We shouldn't have the world's mentality like, you know, the 20-80 uh, the mentality. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. We shouldn't think like that. It should be 100% of the people do 100% of the work because we're the body. All right, 
So we see our actions towards others and finally our attitude towards others. Verses 14b and 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Well, we're to have, we're to have right actions towards the brethren, and now Paul says we need to have the right attitude towards them as well. Right? If we don't have the right attitudes towards them, uh, well, then we really won't have the right actions towards them. And the first attitude we're to have is to be patient with all. And in this context, that would be the unruly, the faint-hearted, and the weak. And we certainly need patience to deal with this group. And patience literally means to be long-tempered. It's to have a long fuse instead of having a short fuse. Uh, and patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit. And it is a component of true love. Right? 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love is patient. And because of that, patience will enable us to let love cover a multitude of sins. Uh, and we need patience with the saints because they're God's children and they're loved by Him just as much as He loves us. I don't care how spiritual we may believe we are or how much we know or how much we do, He loves us no more than He loves any one of His children. The weakest child of God, He loves as much as He loves you and me. So we can't play that card. He loves us all, and He loves us the same. And we need patience to help them grow up and to aid them in their struggles and their misunderstandings. We need patience to bear with the foolish things they say and their fault, faulty conclusions and unwise decisions. And you can't be patient if you're not selfless and in the Holy Spirit who is working in you? We need the Spirit working in us and we need to be selfless. We can't see ourselves as anything and we shouldn't anyway. Thus, we can't do any of these things in our own strength. I'll just muster it up. You can't muster it up. You need God's help to do those three things. Now, besides, besides being patient, another attitude we must have is, is to not retaliate or be vengeful. This is a big one, right? Someone does something to you, you, you do it back. In verse 15, he says, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone. So don't pay back someone who has sinned against you. Right? Don't do that. If they were mean and nasty to you, don't be mean and nasty to them. If they slandered you or, or you were spitefully used them somehow, don't, don't slander them back or spitefully use them. If they gave you the cold shoulder, don't give it back. They don't talk to me. I'm not going to talk to them. You don't invite me to you, I'm not going to invite you tomorrow. You didn't give me a cup of water, I'm not going to get you one. Right? It's easy to do that, but don't do that. Don't do that. Don't hold to that common saying today, and I see it all over the place at times, I don't get mad, I just get even. That's not us, guys. Right? We, we live in a world that lives by that. Right? Just accidentally, accidentally cut someone off on the road and see what happens. You know what I'm saying. They're going to come and do something to you. But that's not how Christians ought to live. And that wasn't how Christ lived. He never retaliated against anybody who falsely accused him or who tried to trick him or those who beat him to a bloody pulp or nailed him to a cross. He could have called down 72,000 angels and, and, and stopped his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane and then wiped out every one of his enemies like that. But he didn't do it. Instead, he trusted in his Father and he fulfilled his will and he died for those who do evil. And we're told in Leviticus 19.18, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against any of the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I'm your Lord. Romans 12.17-21, We pay no one evil for evil. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we're not to make people pay for their evil against us. That's God's job. God will deal with it one way or another. In the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus gave us three examples to make the point that we are not to retaliate. We're not to do that. And and what's at the core of retaliation? Well, you know what it is. It's pride. My feelings were hurt. You embarrassed me. You disrespected me. I mean, that's what we're dealing with. 
And so we read, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 38 and 39, You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Now, now Jesus wasn't dismissing civic punishment, which was an eye for an eye, but rather taking personal vengeance. And to be slapped on your right cheek meant that the person doing the slapping was often using their right hand because most people are right, and so they're using the back of the hand. It's like a back of the hand slap to the right side of the face. And, and the thing is, nobody ever died from a slap in the face. But they're greatly humiliated by it, aren't they? Hurt their feelings. Hurt their feelings. And so what Jesus is saying is be humble. Be poor in spirit. See yourself as nothing. And that's the same message in verse 40 where it says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Are you taking this? Take this too. I'm not vengeful. And also in verse 41, if anyone wants, I'm sorry, yeah, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him, I, I, I did that twice. Also, and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And in that day, the Roman soldiers had the authority to say to you, Benny, I want you to carry all my equipment and you've got to go one mile. If I want you to go one mile, you've got to go one mile with this 200 pounds of equipment and you can't say no. Jesus said, you know what, tell him I'm going to go two. I'm going to take it one, I'm going to go one more because I don't have any ill in my heart against you, even though you have ill against me. That's what he's saying. So no pride, no pride. And pride is the root of retaliation. But we're to be humble. We're to see ourselves as nothing before God. And, and I've said this quote maybe three times already, but you probably hear another five as long as I'm here. And it's by Spurgeon, it's this. If any man thinks ill of you, do not be angry with him, for you are worse than he thinks you to be. You're worse than he thinks you to be. And you know what? The poor in spirit, they say, that's right, I am. So humility says, I'm worse than you think I am. And it's only by God's grace that I am who I am in God. So don't render evil for evil. Uh, and that includes the escorts at the abortion clinic, right? And the person that hurt you at the office. And the, and the kid that picks on you at school. And the neighbor who sticks it to you every chance they get. Instead, Paul says, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. And pursue means to eagerly seek after. Eagerly seek after it. So eagerly seek after what is good, not what is evil. Even if evil comes your way. And what is good is what is beneficial and is what will bless them and what will encourage and build up the body. Galatians 6.10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. We read Ephesians 2.10, if we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it would do what? That it may impart grace to the hearers. Never should a curse word come out of your mouth. Never should a vile word come out of your mouth. If it's in your head, ask God to crush it right there. Put that captive. Never should you say anything hurtful to anybody. It's sinful. We shouldn't do that. That's the old us. It ain't the new us, right? So we should speak words that edify, build up. And in Titus, we're told to be a pattern of good works, be zealous for good works, be ready for every good work, and to maintain good works. So we could say that the book of Titus has a lot to do about good works. Why? Because our good works glorify God. They glorify God. So instead of being vengeful, we do good to them. We bless them. We, we help them, and we pray for them. And in so doing, we show them Christ. And if we would think and act the way God calls us to in verses 14 and 15, we would find that as a church, we will grow in godliness and in effectiveness. And God would be all the more glorious in our midst. Amen? I want to close by asking two questions. And the first question is this. How do you deal with the not-so-easy-to-deal-with saints? How do you deal with the not-so-easy-to-deal-with saints? Do you just push them off? 
Do you say, that's someone else's problem? Well, I'll tell Pastor Pete and Pastor Phil. Let them handle it. What do you do? Do you go to the unruly and say, listen, brother, this is not God's will. Listen, sister, this is not God's will. Do you lovingly point out where they're out of line for their own good and the good of the body? Well, you just tell it to the pastors. Well, you complain to other people about them. Oh, did I tell you about so-and-so? And you know what so-and-so said? I can't believe they're so weak. I can't believe they're even a Christian. Ba, 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 ba. Or do you just avoid them altogether? I'm not going to talk to him. I'm not going to talk to her. And do you comfort the faint-hearted? Do you come around them and listen to them and, and bring them the balm of the gospel? Do you do that? Are you an upholder of the weak? Do you work with them, helping them to understand, being patient with them? Help them to understand the grace they've been given. Do you wrap your arms around them to hold them up? Or do you have no patience with the unruly or the faint-hearted or the weak, wishing that they would just grow up? I sadly have done this. I just wish they'd grow up. But guess what? I forget. It took me 15 years to grow up. Brothers and sisters, if we don't do these things for our family in Christ, who will? Who will? And if today you can't honestly say you warn the ruly, you comfort the faint-hearted, and you uphold the weak, then you need to ask God to forgive you. You need to ask God to forgive you and to grow you in this, for this is His will for you. Amen? Now my second question is this. Do you return good for evil? Do you return good for evil? Are you growing in returning good for evil? Do you even think about returning good for evil? I know that the world can't get this, but we're not the world. Do you think about it? Because if we don't think about it, I feel we'll do what comes naturally, and that is to return evil for evil. But we should desire to be above that, and we can be above that because we have the very nature of Christ in us who is our example, a great example of what it means to be reviled and not revile in return, who blessed and prayed for and did good to those who spitefully used him. You see, instead of retaliating, retaliating against men for their evil, he suffered God's wrath for it. He suffered God's wrath for their sin. Not all men, but those given to him by the Father, those who are the church. And when men... And the devil, through their absolute worst at him, he endured it, looking to his Father, submitting to his will, and accomplishing the redemption of sinners. So not only did Jesus take their evil, but he satisfied God's judgment for it. And let us not forget, when we were the Lord's enemies, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. He died for every wicked thought every evil word and deed that we would ever commit, placing them upon himself so that we could be fully pardoned for them. So it's really a small thing when you think about it that way that we should imitate Christ and care for the weaker among us and not pay back those who offend us, but rather do good to all. Would you not agree with that? Amen, right? Now to the unsaved today, let me say to you, the best good you could do or pursue is Christ and his gospel uh, and life in him forevermore. The, the, best, the best good you could know is not financial prosperity, is not great health, is not long life, is not living in a great neighborhood or driving a great car, but is the forgiveness of sins in Christ. It's knowing God intimately, the very one who created you and can save your soul from the very wrath of God that's going to come because of your sins. Uh, and, and this great good is offered to all. The, the, uh, the offer goes out to all men and all women. And if they repent of their sins, and if you will repent of your sins and trust in Christ and Christ alone, then this great good could be yours today. For the scripture says, today is the day of salvation. So today you can surrender yourself to Christ as King and Lord of your life. You can surrender and be saved. And the good Lord will give you the good gift of everlasting life, amen, but you must come to him and cry out to him and surrender and turn and follow. And if you don't understand that and this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense today, please see me, see Pastor Phil or anyone around here who's been a Christian for any length of time then they can tell you what it means to know Christ, amen? Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you that you don't save us just to keep us from hell, but Lord, to glorify you in this life, to be trophies of grace. Lord, to be the light as we reflect the light of Christ to a very dark and dying world. And Father, you want the church to operate in love for one another, in care for one another, and to uphold one another and admonish one another. And Father, I pray you would forgive us if we don't want to do those things or we've never done those things or we want to but we're afraid. I pray that you would grow us, sharpen us, challenge us, grant us the grace to cry out for that in our lives. And Father, for those of us who are, who are unruly, I pray that we would repent of sin and we would be in line with your good and perfect will. And for those of us who are faint-hearted, I, I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that you would grow us in that area. I pray that we would become strong in confidence and assurance of the very gospel that has saved us. And Lord, for those of us who are weak, I pray again we would mature. We would understand grace. And Lord, we would want to live holy, but also we want to give grace. And so, Father, would you grow us as a body, that we would function well as the people of God, for the glory of God. And Lord, for the soul, the soul sitting here right now watching this thing on Facebook Live who are not saved, they're not in the kingdom, they're, they're apart from you. They may like you, they may like Christ, they may like the gospel, but Lord, their heart has not been changed. There has not been regeneration. They don't love Christ with all of their heart and soul. And so Father, would you draw them to Christ? Would you save them? Would you show them the beauty and glory of your Son and the great love that he has for sinners? For he receives sinful men. And Father, would, would it be this day, Lord, that you would do that for them? Magnify the beautiful, glorious name of your Son by saving sinners here, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.